Okay, so today is September 8th, 2024. We are here with Lad and Joy Peary, longtime members of the Miami Ward. Um, we would like to start, uh, Sister Peary, with you. Can you tell us a little bit about your background uh, uh, growing up in the Miami Ward, what uh, the life in the church was like, uh, uh, your family, that type of thing? Sure. So I... Um was born and raised um, here in the Miami Ward. I was baptized at the age of eight um, in our Miami Ward building. So um, that's all I really know. I We haven't always lived here, but that's where I've spent most of my time is in the Miami Ward there. Um, I grew up in a family where my mom was uh, a mom who took us to church every week, kicking and screaming sometimes, but my dad was not a member of the church. And so I believe he was like 54 and I had had three children by the time he joined the church. Um, so I grew up in a home with uh, not having the priesthood. I, I often felt uncomfortable. I can only remember two times growing up that I ever had a patriarch or a priesthood blessing um, just because that wasn't something that happened in our home a lot. Um, I, But yet um, my father was always hundred percent supportive of all of us um, my brother and I um, like I said we gave my mom some trouble um, going to church but I'm glad she was so diligent and faithful in taking us um, I remember being sealed in the temple and my dad would sit in the waiting room at the temple until we all came out um, he also spoke at my brother's um, farewell for his mission but he really at that time didn't want anything to do with the church um, so I do remember as a youth growing up in the church that I felt very different. I felt like all the other girls my age came from families who mom and dad went to church. And so I do remember, not that they ever made me feel that way, but personally I felt like I was a little bit different because I didn't have all of those things that the other girls had. But um, again, I remember having amazing uh, home teachers who were in our home every single month. And I think, I know without a doubt, that's what helped with my dad's conversion to the church. Um, I also remember some very faithful women who were uh, very influential in my life. One was LaVon Welch, and she was a very classy, uh, well taken care of lady who taught. Um, I think it was called beehives and my mates back at then, but she was in our young women's and she really was a very classy lady and spent a lot of time making us feel loved and appreciated. And I always thought what amazing lady. And I wanted to be like her. Um, and so I, I do remember how influential she was in my life. Um, and I went away to college um, and that's about it, I, I never had any intentions of coming back home um, to Globe. Once you leave the Globe Miami area, you have the plan is for ne never to come back, but um, I did uh, come back. I um, met Lad when I was home um, for the summer from college. I went to school at NAU and I met him when I came home uh, one summer from college. Um, at that point, he was not a member of the church. I, well, let me back that up. He was a member of the church, but he hadn't been in, been active since he was a very young teenager. Um, and so he, his family had just briefly moved to the area for his dad to have a job. And lo and behold, um, I had a couple of dates with him. And, and I remember um, something I don't share a lot, but I was married for a very short time to a return missionary. And so I divorced. And when I did, again, that set me on a path that I felt like I was very, very different. But um, I, I met Lad and I remember um, one night exclusively looking into the mirror in my bathroom and saying, what in the heck are you doing? Because I was an endowed member of the church and, and going on dates with this boy who was a member but was not living the standards of the church and so there was a lot of internal turmoil um, with me um, as far as my relationship with lad um, needless to say i stuck with it and he has been amazing we spent a lot of 
time together. We've been married about 36 years, and so I took a, quite a big chance on him, but he's paid off for sure. What a blessing. <laughs> so, actually, before we started the video, you mentioned that your mother, you had overheard your mother saying something. Correct. Yeah, I like I said, I was in a little bit of turmoil as an endowed member who had been sealed in the temple to this boy who wasn't necessarily doing what he should. And I did overhear my mom on the phone and still to this day, I don't know who she was talking to, but I heard her on the phone say, I don't, I, I when I pray about it, I feel like it's okay. I feel like he's good and it's going to be okay. And that's, that's really what I felt many times is that the core of him was good. He, he wanted to live a life in the gospel. He just wasn't. And, and I really, um, I don't think he schmoozed me by telling me that, but I, I knew deep down inside he was really a good person and, and he had a lot of values and things that were going to be okay in my life. So, yes. <laughs> and we may come back and talk a little bit more about your growing up, but since we're talking about... Uh, Seems like we're talking a lot about me. <laughs> so we ought to... Let's, let's have Vlad, or I'm sorry, President Peary, <clears throat> A little bit about his background and maybe his side of the story of how you, <laughs> the two of you got together. Yes. Uh, okay. So uh, I was born in Payson, Utah, and uh, all of my ancestors are probably buried in the Payson and Spanish Fork cemeteries. So that's where uh, I have pioneer ancestors. And uh, so we lived in several places throughout Utah County and Salt Lake Valley. As I was growing up, I have memories of living in West Valley City and Spanish Fork and uh, other places. We ended up in Orem. That's where I really remember most of uh, my growing up was living in Orem. So uh, we moved to, uh, our, we lived in Orem twice. The first house we moved into was in a neighborhood and in Utah at those times that what your little neighborhood made up your ward. Your ward was within three or four blocks. And I became friends with all the neighbor kids and most of them were members. Um, and so I got uh, immersed in church stuff. I, I don't remember really being super active in church. Mm -hmm. I have looked at my records and my grandfather uh, ordained me a deacon, and then my bishop ordained me a, a teacher and then a priest. So I had those influences when, when I was in my teenage years. And it was also at that time that I sort of strayed away from the church. Um, I did not serve a mission because of those kind of things. I have memories of my mother threatening me to... I couldn't go somewhere until, oh, you need to go uh, get the illustrated books of Mormon and read stories from the Book of Mormon. So I had that influence from my mother, and uh, I, I appreciate her for that. And my dad worked in the car business and wasn't home a lot, um, so, but he had uh, he was a, a good father, and I was very fond of him. He took us. Uh, to ride motorcycles and to go hunt, cut wood and things like that. It was, uh, I have great memories of doing that. But I remember uh, leaders in the church uh, who had an influence on me, and I think that left an impression on me as I grew a little bit older. Um, at some point when I was still in high school, my parents came to me and said, we're moving to Salina, Utah, which is an hour or so south of, of Provo. And we did, and I went down there and really did not have any, uh, was not active in church at all for those couple of years that we lived there. And um, so I just was not active church member. Uh, and, and I, after that, I graduated from high school, got jobs in Salt Lake, and, and my parents moved to Globe, Arizona. And I was an adult at this time, and so they came down and were here for a time before I decided to come down and check it out, see what it was like. 
And I remember driving into town and uh, going up to my dad and say, Dad, what are you doing here? <laughs> and uh, what did he say? Well, he didn't say anything. It was he was here because of the job, and I was just you know just being a teenage kid. I guess I was older than a teenager. I was probably twenty. Uh, so I worked in that car dealership was was in the McSpadden Ford, and kept uh, trying to find work. And I was one day away from moving to California to go to work with my cousin and got a job at the hospital. And wouldn't you know it, I still work at that hospital all these years <laughs> later. So, but it was at that hospital where I met Joy. And uh, it seemed like our courtship was so brief. Months, months went by. And uh, before you know it, we were getting married. And... I remember she graduated from college. We moved to Tucson and went to church down in Tucson at the university ward. And like Joy said, that was the first time I had been to church in many years. And it has been church ever since. Um, I don't know that I could add it much else for me. Um, so, after you got married and, and you got active, what was it like uh, when you got to go to the temple and actually be sealed to, together? What was that experience like? <laughs> I was just thinking about that, honestly. And so, we were married, and at that time, I was not, I was still a priest. So, we couldn't be married in the temple. And, if, and I know most people remember that if, if you took that course, then you had to wait a year before you could be married in the temple. So that's what we did. And we were together for a year, and, and then we booked our time in the temple. And I can still remember being sealed in the room at the bottom of the stairs, <laughs> which is no longer a ceiling room. But as you go down the stairs, it's that room at the bottom floor on the left, and that's where we were sealed. And it's in the Mesa Temple. In the Mesa Temple, yes. And I was pregnant with our first child, and I remember the bishop um, really working hard uh, to get us to the temple so that Tyler could be born under the covenant. I do remember that part, that he, he pushed really hard to get us to the temple. So, And Tyler was born under the covenant. So... so um What was that like, uh, President Peary, coming back to church after all those years where you had, hadn't been active in church? You know, I think of uh, this part of me has been in some of my talks, as uh, in the talks I've given us in the state presidency. Um, so uh, I mentioned that some of my leaders had an influence on me in my teenage years, and I think I felt the spirit at that time. And I may not have consciously thought to myself, oh, I need to get back to church. But I think, yes, yeah, subconsciously, I knew that that's what, where I wanted to be. And I knew that Joy was, was uh, a member of the church and active in the church. And I, I, it sort of just kind of came together. It wasn't like, oh, I want her. I want her as my wife, and then pursued her hard. It wasn't like that at all. It just sort of fell into place. In fact, she was in Flagstaff going to school. So much we were apart a lot of the time. And she would come down, and I would drive up. And, and uh, that's how sort of how the courtship went. And... But I don't. I've ever, kind of felt like it was destiny, really. I don't ever remember him, you know, from the day we we married on a Saturday and he went to church on Sunday, and I don't ever remember a time where that didn't just happen. Like there wasn't ever a time where he was second guessing whether he was going to church or not. There was none of that. I don't ever. It just like it, he went that one day, and it's like he had always 
been a member of the church. I don't even remember. You started with callings right off the bat. Um, we met some amazing friends in in uh, in our college ward at, at down at U of A, and I mean, they just they were instrumental, I think, in helping us just kind of progress in the church very quickly. That's true. He ordained me to the office of an elder. Yeah. Well, let's go yeah. back, uh, Sister Perry, a little bit to your youth. Are, are there any particular uh, activities or events or things that happen in either in the ward or the state growing up that um, have left any big impression? With yeah, you? I, I mean, you always have to speak of girls' camp, I think. Um, there were definitely growing moments there and definitely opportunities to fill the spirit. I do remember, um, so we had um, in seminary, so we had Brother Judd and Brother Stewart. And still to this day, Brother Judd is one of our dearest family friends. He did, um, anyway, He he's just been a, a part of our lives ever since then. But back then, the seminary teachers would, take us and I, I you probably can't do this today but they would load us in their cars and i remember them driving us to to byu to um efy camp and those kind of things and i remember uh one of those times uh as part of our activity at efy we walked up to the provo temple and i remember sitting on the grass on the hill beside the temp behind the temple and that's where i really remember having my very first super powerful experience with the spirit knowing that the path i was on was where i needed to be but um you know just those opportunities as a youth um to be able to to go where and i think the youth still in our state kind of have that opportunity when they get outside of the city limits and see really how big the church is and how how uh, there's others just like us with testimonies, how impactful that is. So I do remember that. Um, those are those are probably the, the biggest things. I did go to girls camp every single year and made some amazing friends who, you know, Tina McCary is still here in this area and, and those girls that um, you know, that I grew up with and, and their spirits and their testimonies really helped me as as somebody who could have easily gone either way because my dad wasn't a member of the church. So um, I could have easily lived that a different kind of life and so, so very blessed on the path that I ended up on. So do you have, uh, do you have any memories from primary and in particular, I'm guessing that probably, at least for some period growing up, you would have had primary uh, during the week at the I church. Don't Do you recall mm -mm, that? I don't remember a lot of primary. I, um, my mom talks about that I wasn't always really nice in primary, so I know I went to primary. <laughs> I don't remember primary, but I do remember, you know, twelve-ish on, and mostly with Sister Welch is what I remember the the most. But I don't have a lot of memories of primary. You know. And of course, with Sister Welch, uh, Brother Welch was a member of the state presidency. Correct, correct. At some point. Yeah, correct. Okay. Um, well, we talked about your, your getting married and, and going to the temple and being sealed. Um, and your first child was born in the covenant. Mm -hmm. um, what was it like? What, well, when you got sealed, were you already living back here in the the Miami Ward, or were you still? No, we lived in Tucson, um, and our first two children were born in Tucson, and then we moved. Um, I left my job in Tucson, and uh, we moved back to Flagstaff so that Lad could continue going to school up there at NAU. Um, and so we moved back to Flagstaff and lived there for about mm, seven years. Our third child, Logan, was born there in, in um, Flagstaff, and then... I don't know if people know about this, but Lad got a wild hair that and got accepted into podiatry school. So we sold our home in Flagstaff and we moved our family to Des Moines, Iowa. And he started podiatry school. And we call it our our three thousand mile, ten thousand dollar vacation because we were only there about six weeks. And um, there isn't anybody who loves his boys more than Lad, and so we were there in Iowa and he was gone from us for 
15, 16 hours a day trying to study and, and do that. And he was really struggling, not spending time. We had, like I said, three boys at that time. And he, he just came home one day and he said, I know I drug you all the way across the country, but I'm not going to spend the next five, miss the next five years of my boy's life doing this. And so we were like, okay. So we packed up and we came to Globe because we didn't have a house and we needed to get our kids back in school. So that's how we ended back up in Globe, um, basically, because we didn't know what else we were going to do. So we moved back here, moved in with my parents for about a month until we found a rental home. And the rest is history. We've been here since then. So good thing he's not a podiatrist. <laughs> Or we would have never came back to Globe. <laughs> That's not a story that I, I share ever. Really, I don't ever <laughs> share that story. Uh, I'm not that fond of that story, but uh, it is true. But um, so while I, I don't know if this is while we were in Flagstaff, I graduated from college and went to work as an electrician. And I did that while I was up there, and that's when I decided I needed to go back to more school. We ended up to Iowa and then back in Globe, uh, and I worked as an electrician here for a while and then went to nursing school. So that put me right back at the Cobra Valley Hospital, <laughs> and that's where both of us have been our whole life. So... Uh when you got back here and you had a, two boys at that time? Three. three yeah, we had three there. of our boys. Mm -hmm. uh, what was it like raising your sons here and in, in the Miami Ward and the Globe Steak? Uh, well, let me talk about that for a second. So when we moved to Flagstaff, we moved up there and had no idea, no plan. What are we going to do with kids? Because we went up there, we had these little boys, and, and Joy was going to work, and I was going to school. What are we going to do with our kids? And we luckily met some friends. who was a friend of Joy's from, from Flagstaff before, who ended up doing daycare for us for the whole time we were there. Yeah, seven years. So they become very good friends of ours, and we don't have a lot of contact with them anymore, but they are dear, dear friends. So what that meant when we moved here was grandma was daycare. <laughs> so that was a huge blessing. A huge blessing for us to have Joy's mom watch our kids. So that's what it was coming to Globe. Well, and two, I think, um, I mean, I don't have to say this, but there's amazing people in the Miami Ward. There's people who were my teachers when I was a young child, Nelda Gordon was my first grade teacher and she's in my early society now. And so, you know, there's strong, faithful saints who are there who not only had a huge influence on my life, but have had the opportunity to influence my children's life as well. So, you know, just coming back to a place surrounded by family, both of my grandparents were here when we moved back. And so, you know, my children had the opportunity to to get to know their great grandparents and, you know, and having my mom and dad here, it's such a blessing. Even with my grandkids, now they get to be great grandparents and just that family influence and the structure of having them around. Plus just the strength of the ward. Um, I think, you know, oftentimes people think bigger is better. So you grew up in a big city and kids have the opportunity. I think kids have a lot more opportunity to be, touched by individuals and really um, loved by wards and stakes that are a little bit smaller. So I think it's a blessing to live in a smaller town like this. I agree. So the, so uh, sister Perry, you, you spoke about your, your father wasn't a member of the church as you're growing up and, and I'm sure you're aware we've already done an interview with mm -hmm. your mother and father. Um, and so, you know, their side of the story as to how you and your brother reacted when, when your dad said he was joining <laughs> the church. What did you think when you learned your dad, after all these years, was going to join the church? 
uh, well, I, I know he shared the, his conversion story, but, um, you know, we had no idea. He came home from a retreat from work and he, I think I was, was off at college at that time, but I had come home and, and he just sprung it on us that the missionaries were coming over and he was taking the lessons. And um, my dad is a very, uh, I don't know, stubborn man. And he was never going to do it for anybody but himself. And so it was quite shocking for all of us that he was joined in the church. And, and I tease him and I even shared this with President Pollock a couple weeks ago. I said, you know, it was always great when my dad wasn't a member because we could send him to get food on Sunday and we weren't breaking the <laughs> Sabbath. And so we were like, what the heck, what are we going to do now? But, it, you know, it was, like I said, it just, he sprung it on us and it happened and it was an amazing experience. And he hit the, hit, his feet hit the ground running and he's never slowed down since. So, um, but it was, like I said, quite shocking when it happened because we had no or a warning that it was happening at all. But looking back on it, it was like, it was meant to be, it was meant to be that he was supposed to be a member of the church. Yeah. So, uh, a number of years ago, I think the Miami Ward celebrated its 100th anniversary. Sister Perry, I believe you were in charge of a a project to help commemorate that. Do you want to talk a little bit about I that? I was. I, I, uh, by the way, I was the bishop at that time, and I think it was me that gave her that assignment. <laughs> was that, I can't, I was going to say, I don't remember how, why of me, I'm not an old I remember <laughs> you said, I want to do it. I'm not an she overly talented person. I, I'm a pretty good organizer, but other than that, I don't have a lot of talent. So it was kind of a big task, but I was able to, um, solicit some really good help. Wendy Jonovich and Bambi Norcross, the three of us were just kind of got in there and um, with some help from my sister-in-law who is very creative. Um, it was an amazing learning experience. Like I said, I grew up in that ward. I was baptized in that font. Um, I remember when the building was purple. And so, you know, it, lots of memories of that, but it was amazing to be able to go back and learn from the infancy of the ward and how it all happened. <clears throat> and we kind of did um, <clears throat> a timeline from the very first uh, branch president of that ward, or, or I, he probably was a bishop then, but was able to do a timeline all the way around the halls of the church. And really, it was fun to be able to get to research and get pictures of people and put names to people and learn the stories of of how that building was built and all the pasties that were made. I, I laugh because, you know, back in those days, it was, it was a big feat, you know, a big task to do those pasties every week. So as I was interviewing sisters about what that looked like and how that happened, and they shared with me that, you know, the men would go down the night before and cut up the meat and the potatoes and have it all ready. And then the sisters would get up super early in the morning and do the dough and make the pasties. And then one sister, Sister Beetle, said, and then they would go up the canyons. And I said, what does that mean? And they said, well, the pasty was go up the canyons. And I, again, I said, I don't know what that means. She said, well, we didn't have a lot of, we didn't have ovens and those things. So we would put them on cookie sheets and they would go up the canyons with all the sisters to their homes to be baked in their ovens. And then they would be brought back to the church and delivered out. And so just so fun to hear how things happened back then, things that are, you know, very foreign to us. But um, again, when she said they all, then we sent them up the canyons. Um, and then just really, we at that time had the opportunity, um, I think there was 11, oh, I'm going to get this wrong, maybe 13 bishops. bishops who served in that ward up to that time that we did that commemoration. And we were able to have nine of the 11 living bishops who had served in that in that building returned to this event that we had. And so it was so fun to have those bishops and, and kids who grew up in that ward who were adults coming back. And um, of course, we couldn't have had that celebration without pasties. And so my Aunt Linda and my mom made 300 little pasties so that everybody could have pasties. It was it was a great thing, great, great way to celebrate the, the Miami Ward. Mm -hmm.
And of course, with the pasties, they, they sold them for building funds. Correct. Uh -huh. they, they would make them and, and they would sell them mostly to the miners. But um, the, the story is that each brick in the Miami Ward represents a pasty made. Um, and when, when I ask, well, how much did you sell them for? They couldn't really tell me, but they thought around 75 cents to a dollar. But this, they, they often say each brick represents a pasty made. So it shows you how hard those sisters and, and the brethren made um, to make the success of that building, to make the building happen. Great. And I remember part of that story, and this uh, kind of shows the hand of the Lord in all of it. During the, the time that that building was built, there was a strike at the mine so that all those men who normally would be at work all of a sudden had time to come down there and help construct that building. I think it was nine months. The strike was a long strike, nine months. And, and I know the church, um, it was shared with me that, you know, the church would, the Bishop's storehouse was able to provide those men working on the building with food to help with their families and, Bud Kennard shared how he would take a flat bed truck of Benny Joe Cecil's and go down to the Bishop storehouse and get all the supplies that were coming back to these men that were not even members of the church, but helping on the, on the building and helping the success of having the building built. Mm -hmm. So sister Perry, do you remember, were you here? I think you probably would have been here when the stake center was was built and dedicated. I was. Do you have any memories of that? I don't. I, I do remember it being built and, and how beautiful I thought the rock work on the outside was. And I still do. Um, but I don't remember, I don't remember a lot of that other than I knew it was happening. So uh, both of you have had probably more callings than you can even remember. <laughs> um, anything you'd like to share about in, any of the callings that, that uh, that you've had, and again, you, both of you have been very busy in, um, in your callings here. Well, in all the areas we lived, I, I got, I've had the opportunity, in my patriarchal blessing says that I'll serve the youth of the church. And so I, I think I was consistently in some calling in young women for 18 years. And I went to girls camp for 15 consecutive years, even in the times I'd move, it seemed like when I went to Flagstaff, I got called to young women's. When I moved here, I got called to young women's. So I just a couple of years ago got put in as the Relief Society president. And, and I teased them. I said, my patriarchal blessing says I'll serve the youth. So you guys have to be young at heart because nobody's young in here. And I just, I, <laughs> I was a little leery because I had probably been, this is an exaggeration, probably been to Relief Society a total of 10 times in my, because it was either really uh, young women's or primary. And so I really did not want to go to Relief Society, but how I so love that now. <laughs> I love those sisters and their wisdom and just their spirits that they share. I, when it, I, I loved young women, but I think I love Relief Society more. There's some amazing, amazing women. <laughs> I think I, I never had daughters, <clears throat> uh, but because she served in the young women's for so many years, I had lots of opportunities to go to girls camp. And so I feel like I've been there a lot, been up to girls camp plenty. Um, I, I've Right after we got married, we were in that uh, student ward uh, down in Tucson, and I was – in the elders quorum. I was a counselor in the elders quorum for some time there until we moved. And then in Flagstaff, I had uh, was a ward clerk and an elders quorum teacher. And uh, that's all that I can remember. But we moved to, to the Miami ward and it seemed like within a week, they called me to be the young men's president. And that was a shocker. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Just like that, I'm a young men's leader and uh, spent years doing that, five years, whatever, and then elders quorum president, bishop, and now in the stake presidency. And I have uh, appreciated all of those opportunities to learn and grow. Um, I'm sure that uh, the Lord had his hand in all of that. I don't know that I've had 
enough influence on the members that I have had stewardship over. Um, but uh, President Pollock asked me to go to a coordinating council. Uh, and during that council, it was a, a meeting for stake presidents, and there was a man that was being released, and he they asked him to come to the stand and bear his testimony, and he went up there and, and say, he said this, I wondered why the Lord calls us to these leadership positions. He said, I know why now. And he said, it's because he wants us to stay close to him. And I thought about that, and I thought, would I be this close to the Lord? Would I have a relationship with Jesus Christ if had I not had these positions of uh, service in the church? <laughs> Did you come to a conclusion on that? or That's why. <laughs> that's why. I think that's it. I think the Lord, uh, this was the way that the Lord could reach me, and it worked. I hope it worked. <laughs> now, uh, the two of you also served out in San Carlos for a little while. Yes, we did. Would you like to talk about that, what, 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 how, how that was, uh, what kind of experience that was for you and, and your, your kids? I think, I think I was still in the Young Men's Presidency at that time, and uh, I, can, I can remember Brother Lamb. Right? Was it him? Mm -hmm. He was serving in the stake presidents at the time. and He extended that calling. And right at that time, we were building this house. And I was just graduated from nursing school. I was building this house. And they called me to that, and I felt overwhelmed. I didn't know how I was going to ever do any of it. And, uh, but we did. We didn't, we didn't make any compromise in church. We didn't make any compromise to family. Nothing. We just pressed forward and we got it all done. And our time at San Carlos was was a very special time. Uh, a new experience for me to be out there and be introduced to the culture of the, the Native American population and, and feel the spirit of those people. They have a very special spirit about them. And my kids were little at that time. And I thought it was what a great thing. For, for them to learn and to see as they were growing. And I don't regret that time ever. No, there's amazing, amazing people out there. Um, you know, I, I still see Sister Shorten, and I, she just wraps her arms around me. She is, there's amazing, amazing people in San Carlos, and what a, what an opportunity for us to serve out there and for the growth that we were able to experience. Um, we, we laugh because uh, Sister Shirley Gibson and Frank served out there with us. And so Lad and Frank would drive out in the morning and I would pick up Shirley and the four kids and I and Shirley would go out and she would bring cookies every Sunday and she would put them on the, the dashboard of the car. So every Sunday when we got out, we got, basically hot warm cookies, cookies, warm cookies on our way home from church, but um, fond, fond memories of San Carlos and what a blessing to be able to serve out there and the relationships that we still have to this day with the saints out there from San Carlos. We still have friends out there. Yep. One of the things we've been asking a lot of people about is uh, whether, and you've talked about some of these already, I think, but uh, whether there's been any special acts of service that maybe you have been recipients of over the years that have been impactful in your lives. Anything come to mind? You know, I, I have to go back to that with my father. I mean, um, I there were men in, in the Miami ward who took our family under their wings. Um, Brother Fred Markham baptized me as an eight-year-old, and he was our home teacher at that time and very valiant saint. And, and then Brother Kennard, I, he's still my parents' um, ministering brother, but he was in our home and he always treated my father as the, the patriarch of the home. He would ask my father if he could come. He would ask my father if he could, if somebody could pray in their home. And so, you know, I think 
I'm ever, forever grateful and indebted to those men who were valiant and did the things that the Lord asked them to do. I mean, by far, that's the biggest one for me is just the ministry that happened to a, a sister who, you know, was the only one who drug her kids to church. And But my father has always been a good man. And, and I think there's many members, Galen Thompson befriended him, um, Wayne Blake, they were all very, very good to him. And I think that he's where he is in the church today because of the examples of those valiant men. I think, well, what, what I'm going to talk about is similar to that. Uh, when we moved to Globe, I really hadn't had a lot of experience in being a member of the church. I mean, I had been a member my whole life. Uh, but uh, we came to Globe. I received a new calling in the church. And I remember uh, going to a, a stake leadership meeting over at the stake center, and Steve Burke came up to me and was friendly. And I remember my mother telling me that this they had moved back. They, they came here for two years and left me and my younger brother, Justin, behind. And they moved back to Utah. And Justin and I both found wives right here in this little town. And, and we were married within a year of each other. So we've both been married about 36 years, 35 years. But um, so my mother tells me that some of the nicest people she's ever met, friendliest people she's ever met were the the men and women of Globe, Arizona, and the members of the church really have uh, welcomed us. They welcomed all of us into this town, and their acts of kindness and friendship and their ministering um, really made it a home for us. And... Uh, well, <clears throat> I don't know how this has happened, but so far my sons are still here, and I'd like to say that in part that might be why that they feel at home here also. Well, a couple of things. Um, before we end, I want to give you an opportunity if they thought of something as we've been going on that you think, well, we should share this. Now would be the time to do that. And also invite you to, uh, both of you, if you will, to, to leave a brief testimony. I can't think of anything else that you need to share other than lads of baby and me crying. <laughs> but I would be honored to share my testimony. I, I, um, I'm so very grateful for the gift of the gospel in my life. So, uh, for, in my life, I um, I have a testimony of my Savior Jesus Christ, and I've had several opportunities in my life when I received blessings where I know without a doubt He knows who I am. He knows my strengths. He knows my weaknesses, um, but He knows who I am, and and I feel that way for everyone. I um, I. I know that the prophet leads and guides us today. I, I feel so blessed for the opportunity that we have to have the temples that dot the earth. I, I was in the temple a few months ago and was really kind of struggling with some close people to me who have decided to leave the church. And I just, it made me question, could I leave the church? You know, I have this testimony and they had it too. Could I leave the church? And so that was very bothering me um, as to how somebody could be where they were and leave the church. And so I was in the temple one day and I just got this over, I love the temple, but I was in the temple and I got this overwhelming feeling that I can never leave the church as long as I'm in the temple. Um, and I feel that strongly. Um, the blessings and the covenants that we are able to make with our Heavenly Father in the temple are what keep us on the straight and narrow. And we're so blessed um, to have 
the gift of the gospel and the gift of the temple and to um, be able to have the technology that we have and yet it's so easy to get off the path if we um, focus on the things that are we feel are so important but i just i i know um that the power of the priesthood is real i didn't have that in my home so i think now that i have it in fivefold i have lad and my four boys who all have the priesthood and and what a blessing i think Heavenly father blessed me because i didn't have that growing up so i got it five times and i i know that the power of the priesthood is real and these things i say in the name of jesus christ amen yeah. she does think she's too tough to get a, a priesthood blessing because i offered all the time and she, no i don't need it um yeah the so sometimes when I think about the course that my life has taken, um, I think, wow, what were you thinking? What were you thinking when you did that? Uh, I'm not still not sure what I was thinking. I think it was the natural man in me that was just taking me places. And, and I just not long ago, I think it was Elder Holland, and I listened to a talk that he he gave, and I'm not sure if it was him, but. Um, I've thought about that, that, uh, oh, maybe the interview we'll have with our savior at some time when this is, well, when it's over, when we're in heaven with him and we're going to have a chance to talk about the things that, that we did good and maybe the things that we didn't do so good. And his comment about that was, He's not going to chastise us. He's not going to embarrass us. He's not going to maybe make light of those bad things. He's going to he's going to say, "What did you learn?" And. I'd imagine I'll have a lot to say. I think that's what it's been for me is just learning. And I still don't have it all figured out. There's still so much more for me to learn. And I know that uh, what I said about the people of Globe Arizona has uh, strengthened me. And I'm so interested and curious about uh, the, the people here. And I go to church, and this is part of my testimony. And I feel like I'm with my friends. Well, I, I know that's true. Um, I know that our Savior is there. You know, I think about that uh, poem, or scripture, I can't remember which it is. I think it's a poem where the guy's complaining because he thinks that the Lord abandoned him. And the Lord tells him to look at the footprints in the sand and said that You've those footprints that are there are mine. Sorry, meaning the Lord's and He was carrying you. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't need to do this to re record it on film forever. <laughs> <clears throat> but I know that uh, President Nelson is a remarkable man, and he is an apostle, and we're so looking forward to having an apostle here with us, and, and they're all apostles, and it's going to be so exciting. And I know that they are men of God, and President Nelson is our prophet at this time. I am so intrigued by, by Joseph Smith. And I 
wonder. I don't know if it ever happened this way, but when we were in heaven and the Lord was handing out callings and he gave he gave that one to him. Sorry, what a job he had. What a remark remarkable job he did. And I know that, that this is not made up, and I know that it's true. I know that the gospel is true, and it's here to bless our lives. I feel that. And in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Well, thank you to both of you for uh, sharing your stories and your testimonies with us. <laughs> thank you.